Almighty, we're glad you're here. You may be seated. So great to have Kathleen with us. We're thankful God brought her through her surgery. And wow, we're glad she's back this early and certainly are praying for her continued recovery and healing. Tara and Rachel are going to come now and sing for us and hope that uh, you'll listen with your heart as well as your ears and let the message of their song be a blessing. sisters. That's a blessing, isn't it? I want you to open your Bible, if you will, to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter number 5 is where we're going to be. Ephesians chapter number 5. Amen. We're going to begin reading some familiar scripture. We've covered what came before and then we're going to read through uh, the end of the chapter here and uh, get into the message. So Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, let's begin there. Ephesians 5 and 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore... As the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with a washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies, he that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. <clears throat> for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be <coughs> joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular, so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Let's pray. Lord, help us today. Open your word for us and give us the things that we have need of. We're grateful 
and for the way our hearts have already been touched through not only testimony and congregational singing, but the special that was brought to us. I pray now that in thy word you would open our hearts and give us the things that you'd have us to, to get today that we might leave here, Lord, having heard from you and uh, that our lives would be closer to you. And we'll thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen. So during the month of June, we have been discussing uh, the marriage. We've been talking about uh, a series on Ephesians 5 and drawing some other scripture in and talking about what God would have for us in our marriages and in our homes as Christian people. We talked about the key to marriage. And then we talked about how to revive a marriage. And sometimes, sometimes you find marriage in need of reviving and resuscitating. This world has a way of sucking the breath out of relationships. And it's certainly true in the family unit. And in the day and age in which you and I live, we find ourselves where the family is not only de-emphasized, but it's fractured and fragmented, and many young people grow up in a home not having any idea whatsoever how to build a biblical family unit. I want to tell you, you ought to be able to find that in the house of God. It's important that we look to the Scripture. So we talked about reviving. Then last week we talked about the reality of marriage, and some things that, that we have to face as far as the, the vital role that trust plays in a marriage and that authenticity and accountability and affirmation, all of those are essential to trust. If someone is not authentic in their relationship, then there's no foundation of trust on which that, that relationship can be built. We have to take the mask off, and if there's ever a place in the world where people get to know each other or ought to get to know each other, it's within the, the bonds of marriage. And so we have to be authentic. We, we have to be accountable to each other. Let me just say this right now. The first verse we read is submitting yourselves one to another. So I want you to understand there's a mutual submission that comes between husband and wife to where they put the other above themselves and, and there's a humility that comes in relationships that are, that are Bible, and God wants us all to find that humility that is in Christ and to exercise that one for another. And then there's the affirmation. We, 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 ought, to be, we ought to be encouraging each other to become what God wants us to become. We all enter marriage um, with an idea of who we are. We gather that by the assessments that other people make of us. You may have had a dad that told you you were good for nothing and you believed it. You may have been in a previous relationship that you were abused and you may feel like that that's all you're ever worth. One of the things I've noticed over my ministry, Brother Ronnie, is, is people that I've dealt with in abusive relationships often go back to the same relationship. It's because they have, they have bought into the idea that that's all they're worth. And so they were on from one troubled relationship to another troubled relationship to another troubled relationship. And, and what happens in the long run is, is um, it, it, they, they, miss, they miss out on becoming what God wants them to be. Now, now, let me say this to you. The one place in all the world that can overcome that, and, and I'm, 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 I'm talking about human relationships, uh, obviously Christ, we know that in, in the church, but, but I'm just saying the one place that that can, that can be erased and undone is the marriage relationship. If, you're, if, if, if you had a, a, somebody that told you you were good for nothing, but your mate tells you you're the best thing since sliced bread, I should have said peanut butter because I like peanut butter better, but, but anyhow, how many of you like peanut butter? Great, all right. I knew, listen, we've got revival. But anyhow, uh, natural uh, gif. But anyhow, let's get off of that. Uh, don't sidetrack me. But here's the deal. L listen, if you have a mate that tells you you are important and you're vital and you're loved, that can bring you out of and help you overcome the scars and the difficulties that you may have collected during your life from the assessment that other people make on you. Now, this is very, very important. 
Ephesus is a letter written by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit through Paul to a church. And it's about the family. Well, why is that? Because the church is only as strong as its families are. And, and, and the family unit is the thing that provides the backbone. It's the strength of a church. And a church is only as strong uh, as its families are, and obviously it's made up of, of families and, and individuals. So, so he's writing. Now, I love this because when I begin reading in verse 21, I read through the end of the chapter, and, and actually, actually on into chapter 6, where he talks about the children and, and their relationship with their parents, when you read all of that from verse 21 down through chapter 6, verse number 3, what you find is a beautiful, smooth-flowing continuity of Scripture verses. It's wonderful. And he lays such a groundwork there that the understanding is if you will, if you will put into practice, if you'll obey, if you'll put into practice the principles that I'm sharing to you, church at Ephesus, then, then, then your life will not only flow smoothly. What does he say to the children? Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise. You know, okay? And, and listen, th then, then he says, if, if you will obey them, it shall be what? Well with thee, and thou shalt, shalt, uh, mayst live long on, that thou mayst live long on the earth. So the idea is simply this. If we do the things that God tells us to do, we outline our home the way that God wants our home outlined, then, then, then there's a continuity. I want to call it harmony. I want to talk with you about how to harmonize the home, how to have harmony, how to have harmony in the family. And the idea that, that two people meet on a, a starlit night, and they fall head over heels in love, and they get married, and they live happily ever after, and every morning they wake up, guess what? There are bluebirds on their windowsill singing. Summer, winter, spring, fall, doesn't matter. Those birds are always there. Everything's always happy. There's never any problems. Isn't that great? You live happily ever after. Nobody does that. Okay? That's, that's far more romanticism than it is reality. Nobody lives happily ever after. There are things that that duct tape won't take care of. Amen? And, 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 and let me just say this to you. I want you to listen to me. I say this to young couples that I do the marriage. Here, marriage isn't magical. You don't just walk down, you don't just, you don't just come down the aisle and pledge your life to each other and make a covenant. It's actually a covenant with each other. You don't just do that and all of a sudden there's this magical, you feel this pixie dust falling down on you, and, and, and all of a sudden you are, uh, you're, you're magically uh, uh, um, somehow uh, empowered to have a, a, a mystical union that's unlike all others. No, I want to tell you this, I want you to hear me carefully. There's a lot of work, okay? Now you know this, but I just want that to sit on you for a little while. There's a lot of work. There's blood, there's sweat, and there's tears. There's investment that you have to place within a marriage, and, and, and uh, there's apologies, there's compromises, there's band-aids, and date nights, and there's humility, and and uh, a lot of other things that go into making a marriage what God wants it to be. It's not like the movies. Okay? It's not like Disney. It's not, it's not like that at all. The reality of the matter is it takes, takes a lot of work. Now it's interesting to me, and I want to emphasize this, and then we'll get to our first point, but I want you to just tune in on this really carefully. I've said this every week, I'm going to say it again. This is important. It's interesting that in the preceding verses, before verse 21, if you'll read those, what, and we've been through each verse, but if you'll read those verses, what Paul is actually saying in those verses, to summarize it, is before you ever 
get to the place to having a good marriage, you've got to be a good Christian. There's some things you've got to avoid. There's some things you've got to have in your life that are pleasing to Christ. And I just want to say it one more time, and that's, that is the key to a good marriage is being a good Christian. When you stop being a good Christian, when you stop... Listen, if I am not in harmony in my relationship to Jesus Christ, how in the world can I expect to be in harmony with my wife? That cannot happen. I have to be in harmony with Christ before I can have full harmony with my wife. And so that's very, very, very important. Now let me talk with you about some things that we're, we've got to have. Let me, let me give you... Let me give you just a handful of requirements for harmony. If you're going to harmonize your marriage relationships, there's some things that you've got to have uh, in order to do that. First thing I want to say to you, and that is that, that harmony requires cooperation. Okay? Harmony requires cooperation. Now, I think if you read here and, and, and you go through this, you get to the place to where you realize that... Um, uh, he, gives, he gives a lesson to uh, the wife, he gives a lesson to the husband, and he gives a lesson to the children. And the expectation here is that all three of those would harmonize. They, you know what they would do? They would cooperate. The husband can't do the wife's part, wife can't do the husband's part, parents can't do the children's part. Children sure, certainly, in spite of the day and age in which we live, children certainly should not do the parents part. It's not up to the child to rear the parents. It's up to the parents to rear the child. And so the reality of the matter is the, the, the entire flavor of the context that we've read today is that God wants us to cooperate by each one of us fulfilling our assignment that God gave you. He didn't give the man the woman's assignment to give the man the, 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 the woman the man's assignment or the children the parents. He gave us each our specific assignment and God expects us to cooperate together by fulfilling that role in that place there in, in, in our homes. Now, I've said this and I want to say it one more time because, because I think this is vital for us to grasp and that is simply that, that God gives the harder assignment. Okay. If God said to if God said to women, love. Well, well woman's she that's her nature. She gets up, she can barely walk. You know what she does? She gets a baby doll, she starts rocking the baby doll. Women are not their exceptions, but women for the most part are great mothers. You know why? Because they've they've loved no babies their whole life. Now, unfortunately, I've seen some of my granddaughters carrying the babies around by their hair. We're hoping that they'll transition from that from baby doll to real child. But that's natural for the woman, okay? Men, and their exceptions, men find it more natural to submit. That's why they make great soldiers. That's why they stand at Gettysburg and charge across a, a field where canister shot and grape shot is riddling their bodies simply because one man said, it's time to go, boys, and they go. That's why they charge the beach at Iwo Jima. That's why they landed at Normandy, and the officers were wiped out, and it was the one battle of the war that was genuinely won by, by, by the common soldier. It's because somebody told them to take the beach, and against incredible odds, I've stood at Point Du Hoc, where, where, where men scaled cliffs, and, 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 and uh, uh, death rained down upon them, but they climbed and they conquered and they marched across Europe bleeding and dying because somebody told them to go. That's natural for the most part, with exceptions. But God said, I'm not going to tell you to submit, sir. And ma'am, I'm not going to tell you to love. I'm going to swap that. Boom. So now he comes to man and he says love. And it's like, what? Love your wife. Love who? Your wife. No, I love me. I find it easy to love me. Now, preacher, I don't think that's accurate. Look in your garage. Don't tell me, don't tell me that. Don't tell me that ATV's for your wife. Now she may like it, but that's not why you bought it. 
Let's be honest. So, re in all reality, men are selfish by nature. And, and, and the reality is when, go when this verse was given uh, to the church at Ephesus, let me tell you something, it was a radical verse. A man loved his wife? No, no, no. A wife was a possession. And now God said, no, no, no. No, she's, she, you don't list her, you don't list her with your equipment. You don't, you don't list her with your livestock. No, no, no. You love her. Well, how? Exactly as I love the church. Now, can I tell you this? That's a forever goal. Susan, I've been married going on 45 years. 45 years of our life has been together. I still haven't completed my assignment. It's a, go it's a life goal. And then he says to the woman, he says... Okay, I want you to follow him. I want you to submit to him. I want you to follow his leadership. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> Me follow him? Lord, have you seen the decisions he's made? Good night. We go out and I say, where do you want to eat, honey? He says, I don't know. He can't even make up his mind where he wants to eat. And, and when it's obvious we're lost, he won't admit it. We're driving all over the countryside. Honey, why don't you stop and ask directions? I ain't asking directions. I know where I'm going. I'm lost. That's where I'm at. That's where I'm going. You know? I mean, what absolute... Ladies, listen to me. What absolute humiliation to suggest that a man ask for directions. Please don't ever do that. It's horrible. That means he doesn't know where he's going when he's lost. Don't do that. And so God gives a harder assignment to, to each of the genders. And, and, and the reality of the matter is, is, is when, when any of our assignments are out of sorts. No, 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 no. When you rear your children and you, and, and you, you train your children up so that, they, so that they do not obey the authority in the home, you're rearing them up so that they will not recognize God in their life later. Now, they've got to make a choice one day. But it's our responsibility to teach them authority and respect toward authority. That's our job. And, and so if, if, we, if we neglect to do that, then you've got kids that are, that are just pitching fits and in rebellion and screaming at mom and dad in Walmart and embarrassing them everywhere and... Then you got a wife that won't follow the husband, the husband that obviously doesn't love the wife, and man, you got a dysfunctional home. It's a mess. The thing that, the thing that God created, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife. Now, instead of being a lot like heaven on earth, it's not. It's a mess. And so we're to... Cooperate. You ever been to an orchestra and got there early? And they're all up there on, on the stage, and each guy's got his instrument and he's playing. He's hit, I mean, it sounds horrific, doesn't it? I mean, just, and they're, man, they're playing these instruments, and, you know, the guy, you know, on the, he's, he's playing the, the cello, and everything's going on, and the horns, and the brass, and the percussion, and the string, it's, it's all happening at once. And you sit there and think, man, alive. Plug my ears. This sounds horrible. But you know what happens? When, when, when they get to the place to where the maestro walks out and draws their attention, and they all start playing their part according to plan, all of a sudden, out of absolute teetotal chaos, you have beautiful harmony. You have a symphony. When you get everybody doing their own thing in the home, and there's no true cooperation, I want to tell you, it's horrific. But when you begin to harmonize, and you begin to play your part and do what God wants you to be, I want to tell you, when we become focused on fulfilling the role that God has assigned us, then it eliminates uh, dissension, and it builds harmony, and, and it's a beautiful, beautiful thing.
God intends it to be that way. Second thing is this, and that is that not only does harmony require cooperation, but harmony requires commitment. One of the things I'm going to go to uh, when, I, when I deal with the people in Utah uh, tomorrow and Tuesday, they've asked me to speak on the subject of commitment one of those days. The idea is when you come, plant your stake deep. Drive it deep. Let me tell you something. You don't try to plant a church. You do. You, 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 know, you know, I hate these shirts that say, try Jesus. You don't try Jesus. You either accept Him or you reject Him, one of the two. You don't try Him. He's not a Coca-Cola bottle or, or something. I mean, you know, you, try, you don't try Jesus. You submit and you commit. And we're living in a day and age when, when there's, there's so much of a lack of commitment. And, 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 and by the way, my, my point simply is this. That is that... that, that um, uh, that impacts our relationships with each other, and especially within our marriage. Drive your stakes in. I can't help what your past has been. I can't help the failed relationships of your past. I'm not talking about your past. I'm talking about your present. I'm talking about your right now life. You can't turn around and focus on, 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 on the, uh, you know, the collateral damage that, that, that is behind you Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind, and understand sometimes they're problematic to our present, but the reality of the matter is I'm talking about right now, making a commitment in your life to each other. Passion will get you married. Commitment will keep you married. And that's just the truth of the matter. Commitment will keep you faithful to each other in a world that breeds unfaithfulness, an image-driven world where it's on your computer, on your television, it's on billboards, it's on your phone, it's everywhere. Commitment. The willingness to commit to each other. Commitment will keep us dedicated to training our child when we're tired and when the child becomes strong-willed. Okay? You discover, I've got a strong-willed child. Well, that's fun. Well, let me tell you something about God. You know what God did? I want you to think of it this way. God trusted you with a strong-willed child. I shouldn't embarrass anybody, should I? Tara, raise your hand, would you? That beautiful, sweet girl that just sang, oh, my soul. When she was two years old, she actually organized a mafioso. Okay? She was the godmother of it. Now, the other members were from our nursery uh, in church. Now, Tara was strong-willed. She was a strong-willed child. And she, when I, I was in the waiting room, this was before they forced you to go back, and uh, I was reading Sports Illustrated or doing something, having devotions. And so, um, I was in there with some members of the church, and, and a guy there said, uh, listen to that. And, and he said, man, that kid is mad. So this child that was just born was screaming her head off. I'm talking like I've never heard before. And we're like, wow. And I'm thinking, I'm glad that's not my child. They came right in the room holding Tara and said, here's your daughter. And I looked at her. She closed one eye and stared at me and said, you've got trouble, buddy. We had three blondes and three browns. All three blondes were strong-willed. All three browns were compliant, and and uh, for the most part. And, and and so you know, you you might you might have a strong-willed child. Are you going to quit? Because if you do, you damage the child. No, no, no. Wait. Here, here's the reality. Everybody will look at the child and say, "Wow, that kid's a brat." No, no, no. The the, the problem's not with the child; it's with the parents. They won't do their job. Stay with it. With a strong-willed child, when you lose the showdown, the child gets stronger and you get weaker in the eyes of the child. And so commitment will, will make you stand by the stuff and, 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 and help your child become who God wants them to be. Commitment will get us through the inevitable storms that arise in every single marriage. We all face storms. Commitment will keep us together when problems come and 
and uh, passion wanes and pain paralyzes us somehow. Commitment will, will see us through those days. Commitment will help young love mature into old love. That's what it'll do. I'm going to tell you something. Listen, when I walked down the aisle 45 years ago, August the 8th, 1975, honestly, truthfully, I didn't think anybody could ever be in love more. And I told you this the other day. It's because she was beautiful. And so I, I just, man, I just thought, where has she been my whole life? And I just thought, yeah, she agreed to marry me. Wow, we better get to the altar in a hurry before she changes her mind. I was in love. And I did not think that my love could ever improve or mature. But boy, 45 years later, can I just tell you, it, it, listen, it's, it's better. It's just absolutely better because you, you learn each other, you get to know each other, and, and it, it, it just so enhances the relationship. Commitment will keep you going so that you can enjoy the blessings that God has for you together. Let me give you a great verse of Scripture. We'll go to my next point. 1 Peter 3, 7, listen to this. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them, that's your wife, according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs, listen to this, listen to this, heirs together. Heirs together. Heirs together. What does that mean? You inherit something together that you cannot inherit separately. Heirs together the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. Can I tell you this? God will give to Dean and Susie things that God won't give to Dean or Susie. Okay, li listen to me. God will give to Dean and Susie things that God will not give to Dean or Susie because we're heirs together. God says when you're together and you're unified, I've got some blessings for you as a couple. As, a, as, as this unit, i got some things for y'all. Do you know that God uses the word y'all? I just said it. Anyhow, so, I mean, Paul said, I reckon, so there's some, come on. Anyhow, so, so God says, i got, I got some blessings for y'all that I don't have for you or you. And here's what we do. We stop short. We're selfish. We get mad. We want our way. Somebody said, Mar uh, J Joseph Barth, I think was his name, said marriage is the last great opportunity for two people to grow up. But we don't grow up. And so we fight and fuss and argue and bicker and we just want our way and we, we have our temper tantrums and here's what we're going to do. I ain't going to talk to you. And we go hide. We're adults and we're hiding. We're not speaking. It's crazy. And we miss the blessings that God has for us. Not for me, but for we. And so we have to get to the place to where we commit to each other. Third of all, harmony requires communication. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I, I think that, that, that we've covered this, but, but, but I, want you, I want you to just think about it for a moment. Har harmony requires communication. If there is a basic ingredient that every single book on marriage will have in common, it's communication. Okay? Um, so, so the husband... How, do, how, do, how does the husband win the wife? It's, it's with the spoken word. Love. How do we love? We don't love just, we don't, we don't just love in our minds. We, we verbalize it. As the bride of Christ, how, how, how were we one? It was through the spoken word. It reminds me of school when there's the beautiful cheerleader and, and here's the nerd that couldn't hit a jump shot if he was on a step ladder three feet away. All the ball players are walking around combing their hair in the locker reflection, you know, thinking if she could date me, she would be honored. 
But the nerds doing her work for her and helping her out and doing extra classes and sitting together in the library and he's talking to her, telling her she's beautiful. The, 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 this guy's saying he's beautiful. The, the nerd is saying you're beautiful. You know what happens? Here's what happens. What happens is he wins her by his word. He can talk. I had somebody ask me a while back, how in the world? How in the world did he get her? He could talk. He was a good talker. That's why you see so many ugly men with beautiful women. It's, this room is full of that example here. <laughs> the spoken word. I've never seen Jesus. But as a 12-year-old boy, I heard His word through Bobby Richardson who gave his testimony. And he told me how that he was saved by the grace of God and it was the spoken word that won my heart, you see. And, and so there has to be communication between the, the, the spouses. It's the core of a good marriage. And, and it doesn't necessarily come uh, uh, as naturally as we think. It, at the start of a relationship, it does. But then, then things arise in our life and we become distracted from each other. Job. Get a job. I mean, it's a good job, and you got a chance of promotion, and so they promise you, if you forsake your family, forsake life, forsake breath, forsake food, forsake everything, we'll give you promotion. So you work yourself to death. And you miss out on the best relationships of life. Bills flow in. Children comes along, so mom and daddy stop talking, because kids are loud. We feel like they've got to take up all our time. Can I help you with something we learned, Susie? Now, this is a great lesson we learned. You know what will happen? This is shocking. This is shocking, so you might want to hold on to the chair. This is shocking. And, and you won't figure this out to start, but this is shocking, so be ready for a shocking statement. Children can live without you. If you go out to eat, they'll survive. Now, not at the house all by themselves. Okay, I better, I better, I better make that clear. If you get a babysitter or something, it's all right, you know. When I, well, I mean, you know, we were in the youth ministry, so when, when our first kid came along, we were sort of like, should we leave him? I mean, we got camp. You know, what do we do? Dixie came along. It was sort of like, well, you know, it worked out with him. By the time the third one comes along, take them all, you know. We'll be back in two months. But anyhow, I'm just saying, it's okay. But, but it's a distraction, and you have to adjust your life. So I'm just saying, you know, it's easy. Look, when it's just you two together and you're dating, man, you're burning the lines up. Now it's texts and emails and, 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 you know, FaceTimes and all that kind of stuff. But when you get married, you become distracted. And what happens is communication stops. And when that happens, you're in trouble. So we have to work at staying connected. We have to work at it. And, and, and not everybody defines communication the same uh, because it involves two ears and one mouth and both partners should be skilled in using each of those. But, but oftentimes what you find in a marriage is you have a timid partner where the ears are the main part of the communication. So I'm listening. I'm timid. I'm listening. I'm hearing all the time. Never fully speaking their mind in order to keep peace. So this is the timid partner. Then you've got the intimidating partner that communication, you know, you know, they communicate with a bullhorn. And if they speak forcefully and loudly, guess what that does to the timid partner? That tells the timid partner, I'm making this choice. And that's, that's wrong. That's wrong. If you're in love and you've got the Spirit of God guiding your life, the longer you're married, the more you'll respect the opinion, the counsel, and the communication of the person that you're married to. And it works both ways. We ought to use our ears and our mouth. We ought to listen to what the other person says and listen with authority or the heart. And everybody should have the freedom and the right to express themselves. It's called mutual respect. It's a two-way radio. And we both, ought to, we, we both ought to use it. Now, let me, let me close this point, and I've got one real short thing I want to say to you, but, but I want you to listen to me. 
when it, when it comes to communication, at some point, conflict's going to arise. Now, you're going to have conflict. You, you're sitting there looking at me saying, oh, really, Pastor? Well, thank you for that. No, I mean, you've already experienced that. Some of you are angry right now at each other, I can tell. But anyhow, I'm just saying, yeah, it, it, well, communication at some point becomes about conflict. There's not, there's not a couple in here that hasn't already been through conflict. It happens. But how you handle conflict, how, let me say it this way, how you communicate through conflict is going to determine the health of your marriage. And um, I want to just give you this, don't get personal. You know what kids do? They call each other names. Somebody will run in the house, you know. Harper will come in and say, normally it's not Harper. Harper's the one doing it. So normally it's Huddy comes in and says, uh, Mama, uh, 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 Harper called me dummy. Okay? Well, six and stones may break my bones, but words hurt too. That's the way it should have gone. Words can never hurt me. What was he smoking when he wrote that? Are you kidding me? Words can never hurt me? He was high. But listen, no, no. Words, words, can, words can decimate you. Words can ruin your life. Word, words, words can wreck your career. Words can wreck your reputation. So don't get personal. No name call. That's childish. No name calling. Be careful with your words that you use. Don't pout. The silent treatments for children stay with the conflict at hand. Don't, no smoke screen. Well, two months ago, you said, no, 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 no. Stay with the conflict at hand. Work through this problem. Get through it. Edit yourself before, before you speak. Think before you speak. Don't argue over things that don't matter. Don't let debris build up. Clear your marriage of debris. Because when debris is on the ground, nothing can be built until it's cleared. And people let it pile up and pile up and wonder why their marriage is stifled. It's because you've got years and years and years and years of debris that have never been cleared. Clear the debris. And then last of all, not only does harmony in the home require communication, it, it, it requires companionship. You know what the word divorce means? You, you notice this so careful. The word, the word divorce comes from a Latin word that means to go your separate way. And you can have a marriage certificate on the wall or in a top drawer, but you can be divorced in finances. Together and everything else, but you, you're, not, you're, not, you're, not, you're not communicating and cooperating. There's no companionship in your finances. You're child rearing. You fight over the children in front of the children. There's no companionship. I'm just simply saying that there has to, there has to be a companionship there. You, you, listen, you ought, to, you ought to serve the Lord together. As for me and my house, Joshua said, uh, you do whatever you want to do, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve God together. There, there's, a, there's, a, there's a cooperation that's there. There's, there's an important part of that. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And... And, and, and we have to give ourselves to each other. There, there is a companionship that is very, very, very important. Laying down your life for your friends. You know what your wife or your husband and your children want more than anything? They want your time. Benjamin Franklin said, time is the stuff that life is made of. You can't buy time. Time is the greatest gift that you can give someone. The time to listen. Sometimes it's just quiet time together. Sometimes it's a walk. But it's time. Because time is life. When we lay down our life for our friends, we're not cutting off a chunk of who we are. Here's my thumb. No. We give them our time. And in doing so, we give them our life. Schedule regularly time that's non-negotiable. Unless there's an emergency, be creative with your time. Avoid predictability. Spend time together. It's, it is, listen, listen, listen. 
It's worth the investment and the money. Can I give you something my dad? He was an unsaved man. Didn't get saved until I was 17. Let me tell you what my dad taught me. My dad taught me that family time was vital. He's an unsaved man, but he knew family was important. And, and he worked tirelessly on extra jobs and things so that every single summer of his life, he took his family on vacation, every single summer of my life, I went on vacation. Except, Brother Joe, when I failed math. I had to go to summer school. He told me, you fail math, you don't go on vacation. <laughs> I failed math, didn't go on vacation. It's the only summer I ever missed. I didn't think he would do it, but he did it. And I think you can tell now I still have a mental block because of it. I struggle with it. I wake up at night thinking I'm still at home and they're on vacation. No, no, li listen. I'm just saying it's worth the investment. Well, we can't afford it. Uh, you, you can't afford not to. No, no, no. Susie, how many years, how many years that we did nothing but get somewhere with family? Doesn't have to be some big deal. It's just time together. Sit and watch, we watched the, in, one vacation, we watched the entire series of the Honeymooners. How many of you know what that is? Okay, good. Combat. Okay, anyhow, I'm just saying, it, it, listen, it's, it's worth the investment. Do it. And then, you know what, when you, here's, here's, here's the closing thought, is the first thought. For me to have the right kind of marriage, I've got to be Christ-like. Dean loved her like Christ loved the church. Susie submit and follow Dean like the church should follow Christ. You, you, did you notice, you notice who the main character in those verses are? It's not Dean, it's not Susie, it's Christ. He's in both of them. So if Dean is Christ-like and Susie is Christ-like, guess what happens to our marriage? Some harmony there. Because we're both treating each other like Jesus wants us to treat each other. Dean's out of the picture. Susie's out of the picture. Who's in the picture? Christ. That changes your marriage. It changes your relationship with each other. Then when she wrongs me, notice how I use that. Then when she wrongs me, well, why should I forgive her? Because that's what Christ would do and did for me. When I wrong her, and I go to her and say, Susie, I'm sorry. I really blew that. Will you forgive me? Well, why should she forgive me? I've messed up a lot. I've had to ask forgiveness before. Why should I forgive you again? Because Jesus forgives us all again, doesn't he? Again and again. So when we're Christ-like, my word, how it impacts, how it impacts our marriage. Well, let's bow our heads. Could we do that? Bonnie's going to come to the piano. I want you to think about y'all. Think about where you are in your marriage. Your cooperation, communication, your companionship. Forty-five years we've been married. Some of you are up there too. I don't ever study marriage, but what it does, not help me. It helps me. Because it's a lifetime assignment I've been given. It's a lifetime assignment you've been given. It brings us to a place in our life to where we realize how far we fall short, but how blessed we are to have each other. If you're here and you don't know Christ as your Savior, oh, can I tell you today Jesus loves you? Now, we don't have an altar up front that's a traditional altar, but, but listen, if, if you want to kneel where you are, if you, you want to get on your knees before the Lord, then you do so. If you need to talk with somebody about what it means to be saved, we'll take a Bible before you leave this place and know how you can know Jesus as your Savior. You let the Lord have His way in your heart and in your life. 
If you don't know Christ, come to know Him today. Don't leave this building today without coming to Christ. Father, thank You today for Your love for us. I thank You, Lord, that, that um, uh, our marriages are to reflect the beauty of our relationship with You. And I pray that in all things we would put Christ first in our homes, as husbands and wives and as children. Lord, help us, help us to be like Jesus. Bless, I pray, each and every person that's here today. We're grateful for them and pray that you'd continue to do your work in all of our lives this week. Bless us, Lord. Bring us back together safely. And uh, I pray that we would honor you in the way that we live. And we'll give you the glory for it. In Jesus' name, I pray these things. Amen. All righty, stand to your feet if you will. Now listen to me carefully. If you need, if you need to talk with me, then, then I want you to do so. If you don't know Christ, we've seen people come to the Lord in these Sunday school classrooms all back here. People that have come to church and don't know Jesus as their Savior, we want you to do that. And we want to help you. If there's any way we can be a help, don't hesitate. If you need to get in touch with us by email or well, we got cards on the back table. It's got all of our connections you can reach us through. And so please do that, okay? Thanks for being here. Look forward to a great Wednesday night. Hope you have a great week. Now, Marty and Heather, next Sunday's their last Sunday.